All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. My name is Joyce White. I am the Director of Community Relations for Artists and Senior Living of Chestnut Ridge. I am so happy that you're here with us this morning. My partner, Patty Pelican, will be uh, guiding us through. Um, so I will turn it over to Patty. Good morning. Thank you, Joyce. And thank you again for joining us here on this wonderful educational program. And a special thank you to Veronica Reynolds and the New City Library for partnering on this um, educational offering. Um, Artist Senior Living focuses on memory care for people living with Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia and cognitive decline. Through our mission of compassionate individualized care, our associates, residents, and their families join together to create a haven of dignity, empowerment, well being, and comfort. The artist's philosophy is about human care versus memory care. Oftentimes, when memory care is the focus, it becomes about the negatives of the disease and the limitations. When you focus on caring for the human being, you focus on their needs, their abilities, their possibilities, and their uniqueness. The artist way um, stands for the following. The A in artist stands for the ability to have a voice. The R for respecting and maintaining relationships. T for treasuring each person's uniqueness. The I is for integrity. And S is for success and recognition. I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Amy E. Matthews. Amy has worked exclusively in the field of Alzheimer's and related dementia disorders for the past 29 years. Her experience ranges from adult daycare and home health to working as the original activity director in the very first dementia-specific assisted living in the country, and later as an executive director opening a building in West Orange, New Jersey. Ms. Matthews also worked for the Alzheimer's Association Greater New Jersey Chapter for 14 years, providing both professional and community education and training. Amy currently specializes in professional training and community education. She also provides consulting with professionals and families on best practices and helping them create a plan of care for the future. Amy was also a caregiver for her grandmother who had vascular dementia and considers this her greatest experience in terms of understanding how these diseases affect families and how families reach out and interact with professionals. Thank you, Amy. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate that. And I'm kind of more um, into interactive. So if folks have questions, um, I know we're gonna keep an eye and, and allow folks to talk and ask questions as we go. That way, hopefully I can be most helpful. Um, but what our topic is today is what is dementia? Um, and I wanna say, I think everybody is familiar with that term. It's probably realistically one of the most used, best known, and honestly least understood terms out there. Um, but I have to say that dementia itself is probably among the most important terms that we do have a good understanding of. So first thing, dementia is not a normal process of aging. Um, I think the way we can most closely associate the term dementia is if people remember the term senility. We honestly used to believe that as people got older, um, they became forgetful or got senility and that was normal. And we now know there's no such thing as senility. That is not a normal process of aging. Um, forgetfulness to the extent that we see in a dementia is not normal. What is normal as we age is our muscles start to lose size and stiffen, so we shrink a little bit. Our bones become less dense. For women in particular, we're more prone to osteoporosis. Our heart doesn't pump as efficiently. Our senses 
sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell all decline. It takes us longer to learn new information and to retrieve information. And here's the kicker. We need a calmer, quieter environment. Um, and now I'm gonna ask folks, what age do you think these declines actually begin? Mm. And we can unmute if anyone, I just I guess, what age do you think these declines actually begin with folks? 60. Bob, did you wanna have a guess? Uh, someone said 60? Yeah. All right, I hope everybody's sitting down. They begin around age 30. Mm -hmm. um, so none of us are there yet, but I want you to know what's coming down the pike. That's important because if you think about it, most of our adult lives are spent compensating for these subtle yet progressive changes. And usually around 60, 70, 80, we start to become nervous that, oh my gosh, I can't remember our names. I used to be so good at names or I can't remember numbers. I used to be so great at phone numbers. And we get nervous that this is something more serious. Uh, but the first thing you wanna do, anytime you have a concern about memory is take a deep breath. Um, look at what's going on around you. Oftentimes, we aren't giving ourselves the added time, calm and quiet that we now need to learn and retrieve new information. Um, so again, dementia, memory loss, forgetfulness is not a normal process of aging. Um, so let's kind of dive into that a little bit. What is dementia? Um, dementia is actually not a disease at all. Dementia is merely the category of symptoms. This becomes important because oftentimes we'll see or hear a diagnosis of dementia. And frankly, that doesn't tell you any more than what you went into the doctor concerned about. Dementia is caused by something. So you almost wanna think about it like we think of cancer, not comparing the two, but cancer is not the disease, it's the category of symptoms. And the first question we ask when we hear cancer is what's the cause? So when you hear the term dementia, we want to ask what's causing those symptoms because it's not normal. So in terms of dementia, it doesn't just cover all forgetfulness. There are actually criteria for a diagnosis of dementia. And the first criteria is that a person's memory issues are severe enough that it interferes with their ability to carry out activities of daily living. Um, and I'm going to ask a few questions and you don't have to answer. We can just talk through them because I have a feeling they're familiar to all of us. But how many of us have ever walked into the room and we can't remember why? And I'm going to assume you guys are in agreement. <laughs> how many of us have ever lost our keys? Or how many of us have ever run into somebody at the grocery store and they start to say, oh, it's so great to see you. We should get together. And you're thinking, who are you and why do you know so much about me? So this is where we want to take that deep breath. No, not yet. Those are all examples of things we've been experiencing probably for a long time. Um, but the reality is the difference is profound when we have cause for concern and when it's normal. Typically, when you walk into a room and forget why, it is frustrating. But in time, usually when you're doing something different, it comes back to you. Um, if somebody has a dementia, the information doesn't come back. And I'm going to use, if I may, Alzheimer's as the example. When you lose your keys, it is frustrating. Um, but usually, you can kind of retrace your steps and locate them. Whereas if a person has something like Alzheimer's disease, they may actually have the key in their hand and not be able to identify what it's for. Um, with Alzheimer's in particular, people lose the ability to sequence events. So they can't retrace their steps because they don't remember where they began. And when you run into somebody out of context of where you're used to seeing them, maybe it's the bank teller. I am hoping people know what a bank teller is and not all ATM folks. But you see the bank teller only at the bank. So when you see him at the grocery store, it confuses you or tricks you, or it's a person you hadn't seen in a while. Um, but again, often in time, it'll come back to you how you know that person. Whereas somebody with something more serious like Alzheimer's disease may start to lose recognition of a spouse or an adult child. Um, 
So the feelings, and this is what I want you to remember here, the feelings are the same, that frustration, sometimes fear that somebody knows a lot about you and you can't recognize who they are and why they know it. The feelings and emotions are the same, which means we honestly know what it feels like for moments to have these symptoms. That gives us unique advantage here because we know what it feels like. We can recognize it in the person we care for. So that's the first criteria. Memory issues are severe enough that they actually interfere with a person's ability to carry out their daily activities. The second is a person has deficits in at least two of the four core mental abilities. So the first ability is recent memory or what we have come to know as short-term memory. And short-term memory for most of us is a choice. If something's important to you, you do whatever works for you, whether it it's repeating it, uh, writing it down, um, having someone remind you a couple times. So it goes from short-term to long-term memory so you can recall it later. If somebody has a disease like Alzheimer's disease, they no longer have the ability to choose. So a person cannot learn and retain new information. And that's why you may be talking to somebody and even within the context of a conversation, they may not remember what you just said. Then language is the second core mental ability. And by language, we mean receptive language, which is how you understand written or spoken words. Um, as diseases like Alzheimer's progress, receptive language becomes increasingly impaired. So if you go to a restaurant and the person looks at the menu and they read it perfectly, they read everything on the menu. And then the server comes and says, what would you like? And the person goes, I don't know, what do you have? because reading is the long-term retained skill. But as receptive language becomes impaired, the link between the word and what it cognitively represents is fading away, which is why when you talk to someone, you may say, have a seat, and they say, thank you, and just stand there, because the word have a seat isn't connecting with go find an empty chair and sit down. The third is executive function, and this is oftentimes where, as families, um, we start to say, you know, there's something definitely more seriously wrong here. Executive functioning is safety awareness. So if someone was always very safety conscious, if they always made sure they locked the door at night before they went to bed or were not comfortable talking to strangers, and now you may say that the person isn't locking the door at night or not checking on the things they usually did or leaving the stove on um, and burning pots and pans or talking to strangers without any concern or boundaries, um, then executive function may be impaired. And this is often because it's a safety issue is where we start to seek help um, when we can no longer keep the person safe. And help can be all kinds of things. It can be just having family come check on the person more, maybe having the person come stay with us, things like adult daycare, home care, or maybe even assisted living or skilled nursing at some point. The final core function is called visuospatial function. Um, and this is one not a lot of folks have heard of, but basically we know with age vision changes, right? People can be prone to more things like cataracts or macular degeneration, or your eyesight just gets a little worse. But what visuospatial function is, is basically how your brain translates lines, symbols, and maps and places you in the environment. So a good example would be if anyone's ever gone to any mall, um, there's a footprint or a map of the mall when you go in. And when you wanna find a particular store, we can all look at that map and understand where the store is and how to get there. When somebody's visuospatial function is impaired, they can look right at that map, even at the dot that says you are here and have no idea where they are within the context of that mall. Translate that also to if you ever go to a hotel or a building, every floor has what they call an evacuation route map that shows you the quickest route to get out of the building. Again, if someone's visuospatial function is impaired, they can look right at that map and have no idea how to navigate to get themselves to safety. So visuospatial function, if you wanna look at that in practical terms, think about driving. Driving has a lot to do with lines, symbols, and maps. Um, so someone may start to lose the concept of what the lanes are for and not stay in their lane, um, or not have awareness of cars on either side of them. Uh, and to be a dementia, again, 
it has to affect at least two of those four core areas. So an example might be that you're driving and you see a stop sign, but let's say your, your language is affected. So you're reading stop, but it's not connecting with, I have to stop the vehicle. We should still be okay though, right? Because the sign is an octagon and that's right. kind of universal for stop. But now your visuospatial function is also impaired. So the shape of the sign, the lines are not connecting with, you need to stop the vehicle and you blow through the stop sign. So those are the criteria for dementia. I'm gonna throw one more term in there. Um, if folks have heard the term um, mild cognitive impairment, mild cognitive impairment or MR or M MCI is interesting because it's actually part of the diagnostic criteria for a dementia, but by its very definition, it isn't a dementia. Basically what mild cognitive impairment is, is that someone has memory issues or severe enough that other people notice them and they may show up on cognitive tests, but they're not severe enough to interfere with a person's ability to carry out their normal daily activities. They also typically only affect one of the four core mental abilities initially, and not at least two. Um, so technically mild cognitive impairment is not a dementia, but why it's of interest is that often, I think it's about 40% of people with mild cognitive impairment go on to develop Alzheimer's within about one to three years. Now, statistics show what you want. 40% sounds daunting. That means 60% don't. Um, but that's why they really look at that in terms of research. And let me just take a poll. Are we doing okay so far? Does anybody have a particular question or we're, we're on track here? I'm going to take the silence as we're good. Okay, so the causes of dementia, typically they fall into two categories, neurodegenerative diseases, which are progressive, um, degenerative, meaning they destroy the brain, and in most cases fatal. But other conditions can also cause the symptoms of dementia, and other conditions are typically physical, also sometimes referred to as reversible forms of dementia. Um, and often people have multiple causes, which is why diagnosis is so important. And a lot of folks say, well, why get it diagnosed? Because the only definitive way you know if it's Alzheimer's is the biopsy of the brain at death. That's true. However, they can be 90 to 95% accurate at diagnosing the cause of the symptoms of dementia through an evaluation. So it does matter. And if there are other conditions or physical things causing the memory issue, if that's the sole cause, then diagnosis can determine that, we can manage those conditions and the person may regain full function. If other conditions are complicating a disease and making it look worse than it is, then by managing the other conditions, again, we can kind of minimize the effects, what you're seeing uh, and focus solely on the disease. So that's why diagnosis does matter. Now, in terms of diagnosis, it's important to note that it is not a test or a scan or even a half an hour in a doctor's office. Typically, what's most advised right now, and I'm saying right now because I'm going to talk a little bit about research as well, is to get a geriatric assessment or a comprehensive geriatric assessment. And basically, this is a series of evaluations. So they look at medical, physical, psychological, cognitive. They look at... Um, social history. Who was this person? Who are they now? What's different? They also look at a medical history. Who in your family may have had a dementia? And, and I, I say may have had. Um, we didn't always call it dementia. We called it lots of things. Senility, um, dotty old Aunt Marge, um, organic brain syndrome was one. There were all kinds of terms. But who in our family history may have had a memory impairment um, to see if there might be um, something that is running in the family. So by doing all these evaluations, they effectively can rule out the other causes or the physical causes, and they can now more specifically hone in if it is a disease, which one. Um, so it is important, typically, and it's something you have to check with your provider, but typically insurance, once you're 65 or over and, and utilizing Medicare, pays up to 80%. Um, so that's important to note as well. Now, what I said about research is we are very close um, to having a blood test that can be even more accurate in determining if it is a disease, which one it may be. Um, so they are 
constantly kind of honing in on that process. Does anyone have any questions regarding the assessment or the diagnosis? Nope, all right. So let's break it down a little bit. We said two types of causes of the symptoms of dementia. The first is neurodegenerative diseases. Neuro is neuron or neurotransmitter or messenger in the brain. Degenerative means destroy. Um, so basically these diseases progress. Typically the older a person is at onset of the disease and older is described as 65 or older, the more slowly the disease progresses. Um, and that often is due to the fact that your systems just don't work as efficiently as you age. So things don't move through as quickly. That's actually an advantage in this disease. The younger the person is, which is classified as 65 or younger, um, the more rapid the decline tends to be and not necessarily to death, but to late stages. Um, so that's important to note. They are degenerative, so they are destroying the brain. And in the case of these dementias, they are fatal. Um, Alzheimer's is the most common, followed by vascular dementia. And we're gonna break these down and go into more detail about each one. Um, vascular is typically caused by mini strokes or TIAs. Then dementia with Lewy bodies, and this has been in the news recently again, but if you folks remember the comedian Robin Williams, he had a dementia with Lewy bodies. Frontotemporal dementias, and then mixed dementia. And we're gonna get into more detail about these. But they are typically slow and progressive. So a person can go anywhere from three to 20 years or longer um, with these diseases, with the exception of frontotemporal, and I'll talk about that a little more. Other conditions or other causes of the symptoms of dementia, and again, these are important for all of us to be aware of. Often they're noted by sudden change in mood, memory, personality, or behavior. And the key word is sudden. Um, the diseases typically move slowly. So when you see a sudden change in someone's mood, personality, behavior, or memory, that's often an indication that something physical is going on. One of the biggest causes of sudden changes in memory is medications. The older the body, the longer the drug stays in the system. And also, the more differently the drug reacts. So something that worked one way in your 40s can have a very different effect on you in your 70s. And if you look at the majority of medications out there, especially that we see among older folks, a lot of them, including the drugs specifically used for Alzheimer's and related dementias, cause memory issues. Um, so we always want to be aware and constantly monitoring medications. They should literally be reviewed um, every six months, reviewed by either the doctor or the pharmacist is a good resource for that. Clinical depression causes the symptoms of dementia. Clinical meaning it's a chemical imbalance, which can be determined through blood work, and that's part of the diagnostic process. Um, depression has been in the not so distant past misdiagnosed as Alzheimer's disease. The difference is depression, while it's harder to treat, because again, the older you are, the longer it can take to find the right medication or combination of medications for that moment um, can be a challenge, but depression is manageable when it's properly diagnosed. Vitamin deficiency causes the symptoms of memory loss. Niacin, thiamine, and B12, which are all under the B vitamins. And often as we age, we're already not producing those vitamins as efficiently. Um, so that's something to talk to the doctor about too. And I think it's almost automatic nowadays that they look for your B12 at least levels. Certain tumors or infections of the brain can cause sudden changes in mood, memory, personality, or behavior. If the infection can be treated and if the tumor can be removed, then the person can regain full function if those are the sole causes of the memory issues. Blood clots, metabolic imbalances, including thyroid, kidney, or liver problems that are not being managed by medication. Um, and a lot of times you'll hear thyroid. Somebody had hyper or hypothyroidism and that was causing memory issues. When they were able to balance that back out, typically through medication, um, the person regained full function if that was the sole cause. Malnutrition and dehydration, and I'm emphasizing dehydration. Um, the older you are, the less you seek out water. Your body actually is made up of less water as you age. 
Um, and dehydration happens even with the best intentions of staying hydrated. Dehydration often presents itself as someone suddenly becomes more confused or more disoriented and sometimes even more agitated. And I keep saying suddenly, um, let me throw UTI in there, urinary tract infection, which doesn't typically present as one would think, not that you have this over dinner table conversation, but UTIs typically present as increased confusion and agitation. Um, urinary tract infections, we might think that it might present as someone going to the bathroom more or less, or there's pain, or it's more concentrated. But because the person isn't typically drinking as much, the output isn't as much as you age. So that's not the first indication. Typically, it's those mood and behavior changes that we see. But sudden, every single person has a normal pattern of confusion to their day. And I'm saying folks with a disease like Alzheimer's or um, vascular, the ones we've been talking about. If someone is typically clearer in the morning and then maybe by lunch or dinner, they start to become more confused, that is normal pattern of their confusion. It will change as disease progresses. But if the person who's typically clear in the morning wakes up more confused or agitated, then that's a sudden change. So sudden is unique to the individual. So does that make sense for everybody so far? The key with these other conditions, and they can pop up throughout progression, it's sudden. Any questions so far? I'm gonna keep checking with you. Okay. We must be doing good, nobody's got questions. Let's delve in a little bit to the particular diseases that cause the symptoms of dementia. The second most common cause of the symptoms of dementia um, is vascular dementia. And it looks and progresses a little differently than Alzheimer's. It's the same trajectory. Um, but typically, mini strokes or TIAs are almost like little pinpricks in the brain. People can have had a mini stroke and they don't even know it ever happened until on an MRI, you see evidence of it. If someone has had a mini stroke or some mini strokes, it does not mean you have vascular dementia. The difference is with vascular dementia, these little strokes are continuous. So as vascular progresses, it's called a stair step progression. So somebody seems fine, but they're continuously having these mini strokes or TIAs until these strokes do enough damage that the person suddenly presents with a loss. Um, it could be cognitive, it could be physical, it could be a combination of the two, really depending upon where the strokes are hitting the brain. Whereas Alzheimer's is more of a global deterioration, if you will. Um, then the person seems to level out for a while until the next series of strokes does enough damage that they take another dip. Another notable difference between vascular dementia and Alzheimer's is people with vascular can learn and retain new information, whereas someone with Alzheimer's cannot. Um, with vascular dementia, it's intermittent. It'll come and go. You may talk to a person and they seem right with you, and then you come back like a couple hours later and they don't recall the conversation. But then you come back again and the person goes, that's right, we were talking about that. Um, so those are a couple noted difference in how it progresses. Um, it depends on where the strokes hit as to the effects you see, if it's memory, physical, or a combination of the two. And there is intermittent short-term memory. The third most common is dementia with Lewy bodies. Uh, Lewy bodies are abnormal protein deposits found in the brain. They're also found in the brains of people with Parkinson's disease. Now, there's not a necessary link that if you have Parkinson's, you also have dementia with Lewy bodies. They're separate diseases, um, but the Lewy body is a common factor. Lewy body dementia physically looks like Parkinson's. Um, early in the disease process, people can experience things that are very similar to Parkinson's disease, tremors, um, rigidity of limbs, stiff movements, freezing, where sometimes you can't unlock, um, flat affect or no emotion, also shuffle walking. Um, a challenge with Lewy body dementia is from early in the disease process, a person can be at great risk for fall um, because of the physical effects. Also typical with this type of dementia are very vivid hallucinations and delusions. Um, those are things we can see with Alzheimer's disease, but they aren't typical. A lot of times a person with Alzheimer's may misinterpret things going on in the environment, like 
if there's a television show on and there are people screaming, um, the person may incorporate that into the reality. Oh my gosh, thank God you're here. There were people screaming outside. I don't know what's going on. But if you realize it's the television, turn it off. You can often kind of calm the person out of it. Whereas if someone has a hallucination or delusion, if it's distressful, because it's not always, um, you have to kind of ride it out until it subsides. You can't really calm a person from it. Um, so those are some key differences between Alzheimer's and Lewy body dementia. Um, you also tend to see a person sleeping a lot during the day. Um, folks with Alzheimer's can get their days and nights mixed up. A lot of times we can reverse that by trying to keep them up and engaged during the day and then they sleep at night. But about 50% of people with Lewy body dementia also suffer a sleep disorder. Um, when you go into REM or deep sleep, your body's actually blocked from movement, so you can't hurt yourself. If anyone's ever awoken in a fall dream where you go like that and do that shudder, um, that's your body unlocking as you're coming out of REM. 50% of folks with Lewy body dementia lack the blocker. So when they go into deep sleep or REM sleep, they can actually become very physical. Um, and you're not going to catch up on that sleep because the mind and body never get a good rest or a deep rest. So that can be a huge challenge when caring for somebody with Lewy body is the sleeping during the day and not sleeping at night and that constant activity. Frontotemporal dementia. This is the least common of the dementias, and it's very different from Alzheimer's, from Lewy body, and from vascular. Frontotemporal dementia primarily affects the frontal lobe and the temporal lobes of the brain. Um, your frontal lobe, among other things, is your personality, your behavior, your inhibitions. When there's damage to those parts of the brain, you can see very disinhibited and very unpredictable behaviors. Average age of onset for frontotemporal is actually between 40 and 60. Um, so it's younger which also means, again, it's gonna progress more rapidly. Frontotemporal also can have very vivid hallucinations, delusions, um, people's mood and personality changing on a dime. And one of the greatest challenges in caring for somebody with a frontotemporal is that you cannot predict when a person's gonna switch gears, so to speak. When you have person with Alzheimer's, with vascular, even with Lewy body, as you get to know that person's um, normal pattern of confusion, you learn what triggers someone when they become upset. Um, with frontotemporal, there is no warning. Um, you can literally see a person laughing and then out of nowhere, they're enraged. So aggressive behaviors can be a big challenge with these diseases. And because it progresses so quickly, um, it's kind of hard to know where you are in the process of the disease. Uh, just to throw one out there um, that falls under frontotemporal, if you've ever heard of mad cow disease, um, the human form of that is called Kruzfeld jakob or CJ. Kruzfeld jakob is a prion disorder, so it, it, it affects the proton, uh, protein molecules in the brain. And basically, for lack of a better description, turns it into Swiss cheese. Um, that's an interesting one because they believe it's contracted as opposed to developed. Um, so age is the greatest risk for Alzheimer's, but they believe most commonly, and I'm using my words carefully, because there's still not a great deal known about uh, Kruzfeld Jakob, but they believe that it's contracted through eating contaminated beef. You don't hear about it that much in this country, um, but it does happen. And just to give you a picture, it doesn't care how old a person is. Um, from onset to death can be six to eight months to a year. That's how rapidly it progresses. I worked in a nursing home doing training and they had a gentleman with Kruzfeld Jakob and the first um, month I was there, he had just come into the memory care unit of a nursing home. He was walking um, and could have a little bit of a back and forth in conversation. The next month I was there for training, he was already in a wheelchair. Um, the next month, so this is just three months, he was bedridden and then he died about three months after that. So that's how fast it can progress. It is not very common, but just to kind of give you a picture of that disease. And then mixed dementia. And that's basically where somebody has simultaneously, most commonly, 
Alzheimer's, and vascular dementia. So vascular, as we said, is mini strokes or TIAs. So there seems to be a strong link between heart health and brain health. Um, it's trickier to diagnose because it depends how a person presents. They may present more like Alzheimer's with memory issues and then physical toward the later stages, or they may present more with vascular or it's a combination. So when they might suspect a mixed dementia is if someone has that slow progressive loss in memory, um, but also has cardiovascular issues, heart issues. So that's kind of a nutshell. Um, second most is vascular dementia. Third most common is Lewy body. Frontotemporal is the least common. And mixed dementia is actually relatively common, more so than you might think. Now let's kind of talk about Alzheimer's. And I have a video here. So if I can ask, um, any of those statistics surprise anybody? And we can unmute to, to have a little bit of a conversation about that. No? Okay. Um, it is the sixth leading cause of death among adults in this country. Sometimes that's a surprise to people. Um, because we don't always equate it as a cause of death. We're gonna focus on Alzheimer's a little bit here. Um, and often the first question is, how does it actually cause death? I'm gonna give you a new term. Um, neurodegenerative diseases cause progressive brain damage. And because our brain controls every function of the body, um, in the end stages, it affects the, the parts of um, the brain that control breathing, walking, how your heart pumps, um, and that is how it is a direct link to, uh, to causing death. I had one question here. Um, it says, it seems like most of the diseases start with changes in mood and emotion. Is there a set amount of time to give someone before you might want a person to get tested? Being most people won't admit a problem. That's an excellent, excellent question. Here's the challenge um, and my advice. My advice is if you have any concerns, get tested. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a neurodegenerative disease. It could be one of those other conditions that when we get it properly diagnosed, we can begin to manage it. Um, if it is a disease, that's important to know too, even though currently we can't change the trajectory of the disease. Um, we can still put things in place and give people better quality of life for longer. So it's important to get the diagnosis. In terms of people not admitting they have a problem, let's look at this differently. Um, if it's Alzheimer's, and I'm gonna switch to that slide, Alzheimer's is the most common disease that causes the symptoms of dementia among the elderly. If you look at these pictures, um, this is why I say progressive brain damage. And you'll hear me repeat that a lot. Um, why brain damage is important, but it's destroying the brain. Our biggest challenge is, is that people with Alzheimer's typically look and sound like themselves well into the disease process. So it's easy for us to forget that there is brain damage happening. It's not so much that a person doesn't admit that they have a problem, but if it's Alzheimer's specifically, the part of the brain that allows you to remember 
um, if you've had a diagnosis or remember that a person said they'd be back in an hour and you said you never told me that you were even leaving, um, that's destroyed by the disease process. So it's not not admitting it, but their long-term memory is honestly telling the person, I'm fine and I'm doing everything the way I can. You're the one who made the mistake, not me. That's why we see that. So I would say when you first suspect something, um, that's when we want to get it diagnosed because we want to see what's actually going on. I think the biggest stumbling block to diagnosis is fear or assumption that it's a disease, but it isn't necessarily. And even if God forbid it is a disease, the earlier we know, the more things we can put in place and the more we can do. So I hope that kind of answers that question. But look at these pictures. I mean, this says it clearly. On the left, on the top left of your screen, the left side is end-stage Alzheimer's. The right side is a healthy brain. Um, that's damage. On the other picture on the right, the left side is a healthy brain, late-stage Alzheimer's disease. Then you can look at these scans. Late-stage Alzheimer's on the left, healthy brain on the right. Um, why do I keep saying brain damage? Because again, with Alzheimer's, the first part of the brain damage typically is the hippocampus. And if you look at this green arrow, it's this little thing right here. But your hippocampus is basically your memory processing center. It is the gateway through which any new information, if it is important to you, goes through your hippocampus, gets coded and stored all over the place. And I always say your hippocampus is like your mom because it knows where it put things when you want to retrieve information, the hippocampus goes and finds all those bits, pulls them together and processes them into something that makes sense so that you can then act on it. So it's how you store and retrieve information. With Alzheimer's, typically, um, that's the first part of the brain damage. So basically, the gate shuts and no longer can that person take any new information, no matter how important, like I have to take medicine at two o'clock every day, and commit it to long-term memory. So in the early stages, that's why we see people maybe not remembering what you just said um, or saying you never told that to me because if it never got in there, then the person can't retrieve the information. Forgetful, if you think about it, isn't even the most accurate term. To forget something, it actually had to be in your long-term memory to begin with, with Alzheimer's disease, because that part of your brain that allows you to take short-term information and convert it to long-term is damaged, it's not getting in the brain. So you can't recall it if it never got in there to begin with. So as damage progresses, the hippocampus starts to dig deeper into long-term memory where information is still accessible. So what that means is confusing. <laughs> as family members, it really equates to someone having an amazing memory. He can tell you what he did 47 years ago next Tuesday. He just can't remember he's worn the same outfit for five days in a row. He's not telling you or remembering what he did 47 years ago next Tuesday, but basically he's back there. So it's more of a reliving as opposed to a remembering. Why this is important is because sometimes we think someone's remembering something, but people can relive good events and not so good events and traumas. And sometimes that's where we see behaviors happen too. Um, just a quick example of, of how that equates. If you've ever known someone who is a Holocaust survivor, um, Holocaust survivors, if that person also has a disease like Alzheimer's, certain things can trigger, um, like hearing footsteps coming down an uncarpeted floor, sometimes mimic the sounds of guards walking down in the prison camps um, and could cause a person to become very fearful or maybe the person's not eating well because in the concentration camps, because they're back in that time, um, food was routinely poisoned. So there was a distrust and a fear of eating. Um, so those are kind of just some examples of, it's not a remembering as much as a reliving, but people just don't go back into the past. Basically what happens as disease progresses is a person gets ripped back and forth between past and present without warning. So you can be talking to somebody and they're right with you. And then 10 minutes later, they're back in the past in some event. Um, and, and as a caregiver, the best advice is don't try to guide the person with progressive brain damage. Let the person be your guide. Wherever that person is at that moment, that's where we begin, if that makes sense. Anybody have any questions with this so far?
and you can either type them in the in the chat or you can ask them. We're good. Okay. So early stage symptoms. Typically what we may see in the early stage, memory changes. So someone forgetting stuff. I just said that. I just told you that, mom. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. We often call this covering. Um, to some point it may be covering. To another point, it may be that the person honestly doesn't remember that you told them that. And I'm careful about the word covering or hiding because that's intentional. Um, and this is progressive brain damage. So the person is not always able to do it, but basically it's the long-term skills kicking in. Changes in executive functioning or safety awareness. And this is what we said in terms of um, those issues like leaving a pot on the stove or leaving the gas stove on or leaving the door unlocked. That's often where we as families start to say, you know, there's something more serious here because that was not normal um, for that person. Concentration changes, so a person's attention span becomes shorter, especially if there's a lot going on in the environment. So you may notice it more if there's a lot of people over, or if someone, back pre-COVID, if someone were um, in a mall or a restaurant where there's a lot of activity, you may see that person's attention span get shorter. Difficulty with reasoning or abstract thinking. Um, that's where you may see a person have trouble with numbers. Maybe somebody was always very good at figuring out change or balancing a checkbook, um, but now they're having difficulty. And the key is this disease affects people as unique as they are. So if someone was always good at balancing the checkbook and always good at numbers, and now you're seeing a challenge, that's a cause for concern. But if somebody was never good at that, then that's just normal for that person, if that makes sense. Um, difficulty with language and ability to communicate. So you may see people repeating themselves or beginning to have a hard time holding on to a conversation. Impaired judgment, which again goes to those executive functioning or safety awareness. Confusion with time and place, um, because if you can't remember new information or short term, um, time really is irrelevant, if that makes sense. Uh, difficulty with visio-spatial uh, visio relations, so uh, maybe seeing changes in a person's driving. Withdraw from work or social activities, and often in the early stage, the person themselves is very aware that something's not right. They may not be able to put their finger on it, that it's a disease, or um, you know they've had a diagnosis of something, but they know something's not right, so people tend to pull back from putting themselves in a, a situation where it's gonna get uncomfortable, mm -hmm or they can't keep up. And then personality changes. And I wanna uh, preface that. Are it doesn't change personality, it magnifies personality. With and you, basically you what, that, what that means is if somebody had a very strong personality, um, then the personality is gonna get stronger. If somebody was always very sweet and now they're sweeter, then it just magnifies who they are. If somebody seems sweet, um, and or if somebody, was not very nice and now they seem sweet. Again, the true personality will emerge with this. And if somebody was always kind of a jerk, they're gonna be a bigger jerk. Um, but now there's a reason because they have progressive brain damage, if that makes sense. Moderate stage, you continue to see memory decline, changes in behavior. Um, oftentimes people get more frustrated in the moderate stage. You can see, um, I, I always wanna caution, a lot of times I have people ask me, well, don't they get violent or can't they become whatever? First of all, there's no they. Um, it affects people as unique as they are. So it's always each individual is affected differently. But the reality is often behavior um, is a result of something happening in the environment. So if there's too much going on or the person's overwhelmed, they may get more frustrated, the person may or more agitated, but the calmer the environment, including our approach, then the more control you give that person back. Behavior really becomes our most accurate communication. So it's not a can they get violent. Um, most of the time when you take a step back and really look at what's going on in the environment, you can figure out what's upsetting to the person and you can control it. Um, increased trouble performing daily tasks. When we went back to talking about the definition of dementia, mm -hmm. Activities of daily living, dressing yourself, grooming yourself, bathing yourself, using the bathroom, eating. These things are starting to become more difficult. More prominent language problems, moderate stages where people have a hard time now 
holding a conversation. Um, you may have to find yourself pulling out the words or trying to guide the conversation. Greater level of care is required. People need help, assistance. Um, late stages, basically, um, there may be little or no speech left. However, the person is still experiencing the environment through their senses, sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell. And think about it for yourself, because I'm gonna say this again, we all know what it feels like for moments to have these diseases. Think about when you hear a favorite song, um, sound. It takes you right back to a specific time. Think about when you smell certain smells. We'll keep it to nice ones, like think about a holiday meal or a meal that um, was always special in your family. When you smell that, it unlocks very specific memories. Um, touch. You can't put words to touch, but it conveys everything you need it to. So we are still connecting and communicating, even if a person can't talk. Um, and that person is also still connecting and communicating. Incontinence, typically um, both bladder and bowel. Dependence on caregivers increases. And end stages where you really see physical changes. Alzheimer's, different from the other diseases, vascular, Lewy body, um, mixed, I'm not gonna say frontotemporal because remember that's its own entity, if you will. But with Alzheimer's, it tends to spare physical health to the last stages. Um, so typically a person needs increasing assistance, but they can still do things. A person can still often maneuver and walk and participate in care. But in the end stage, it starts to damage the parts of the brain that control walking, sitting, swallowing. So this is where you see the physical and this is typically where um, we see a person um, taken all the way down with the disease. Uh, you saw one in three seniors dies with Alzheimer's or related dementia. Basically what that means is um, while Alzheimer's is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States, um, the older person is, the slower it progresses. So the chance, the older you are, that something else may take you before the disease does, like a heart attack or a stroke, um, also increases. So the person doesn't die because of the disease, but they had it, if that makes sense. Amy, we have a question. Yes. I'm sorry, Certainly. we have a question. Can hearing or eyesight loss lead to dementia? That is an excellent question. When you think about dementia, um, loss of the ability to carry out daily activities, it really would fall into not a reversible dementia, but an other cause. So hearing deficits, um, if it's not addressed or it can't be, so if somebody's completely deaf, absolutely isolates that person. And if they can't hold on to or participate in that interaction, then the person tends to shut down. If any of us um, isolates, we decline mentally and physically. So the key is with hearing deficit, and I'm gonna say even with visual deficit, um, finding ways to still connect with that person and engage. It doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna get Alzheimer's or vascular because of those losses, um, but they certainly cause their own um, memory impairments because the person's kind of shutting down and not engaging in the environment. So whatever way we can, um, you want to incorporate those things. And think about right now, if someone's got hearing issues, um, there are, you can find it on Amazon, there are masks that have a window so that the person can see your mouth. Um, because even wearing the masks, um, especially for visual and hearing impaired, can cause increased magnification of those deficits. Um, did that answer that question? Sometimes I talk so much, I'm not sure I actually answered it. Okay, I'm gonna say, so they don't cause the disease, but certainly that deprivation um, can look like it. Um, so we always wanna to try to pull that person in and engage them at whatever way we can using the remaining senses. Um, one sec. Throughout the progression of the disease, this is imperative as caregivers, any of these diseases. Because a person is ripped back and forth between past and present without warning, there are moments of awareness. That means that that person is never completely lost to us. Um, I, as a family caregiver for my grandmother, that got me through. I have to be honest. Um, you'll often hear people say when a person hits the stage where they can't talk, 
or verbally communicate in the same way that they don't know what's going on. They have no idea. That is absolutely not true. Um, these individuals have an exceptionally keen awareness of the environment and body language. Um, so they can literally read you faster than you can open your mouth to talk. And as the language, the receptive language, how we understand written or spoken word declines, which really is, is notable in the moderate stages, 100% um, of all accurate communication actually becomes behavior, that nonverbal. And you always want to act as though you're in a moment of awareness um, because you never know when it's going to come or go. But even in the very end stages, although few and far between, there are moments where that person is right there. Often, unless there is a visual impairment, you see it in the eyes. Um, sometimes you'll have times of great lucidity. Um, I'll give you a quick example. My grandmother, when she was in the end stages, she hadn't spoken honestly for about a year. Um, and as she neared the end, uh, she had 72 hours straight where she was awake and talking. Um, she was back and forth between past and present, but her conversation was clearly tying up loose ends, thanking people. Um, it was incredible. I tried to stay up as long as I could, but often you'll see those moments of lucidity or awareness in the end stages too. And as a caregiver, that's what's going to sustain you even after the person um, goes. So I say that's important um, that we hold on to. Any questions about that so far? Oh, no, I saw that with my father. Okay. Somebody saw that with their father? It's a gift. Um, yes. I say gift. It's, 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 go ahead. Yes, I did. After not recognizing me for days, he gripped my hand and he knew just who I was and he spoke to me about what he wanted. Wow, what a gift. That's wonderful. That was, that's, I just got goosebumps, but that's the stuff we need to hear. Um, this is a, a quote that I've always loved. Um, it's from a book called The Voices of Alzheimer's and this was um, the wife of a person who died of Alzheimer's, but she said, Alzheimer's is a fierce teacher full of paradox. I have despaired and felt isolated but Alzheimer's can teach the joy of connecting, however small. It can teach how to find pleasure in fleeting moments, how to find dignity in people no matter how impaired. And it can teach that much of a person's essence remains despite dreadful losses. Um, again, that just speaks to why those moments are so important. Um, and again, as caregivers, uh, Life's not about good days, bad days. It's not about minutes because minutes are measurable. They're 60 seconds. It's about moments. Um, and even just one good moment in not a great day um, can carry us through. Uh, so those are the things we always want to hold on to. And I want to show you, this is my grandmother. And I was exceptionally close to her. Um, and she developed vascular dementia later in my career. So I've been doing this for quite some time. Um, but that's her in the, in the end stages. And I asked her if I could take her picture and you don't know it, but I do. That was the look. It was still intact. It was the look I grew up with when I was not doing something <laughs> right or good. Um, and that just showed me that she was still there, um, that this lady was still in there, um, and that we could still connect even till the very end. Um, Great, thank you so much, Amy. And again, thank you, um, Veronica Reynolds and the New City Library for partnering with us on this uh, educational program. And there is a recording of the program. Um, we will send it over to Veronica and she posted in the chat that she'll be able to share that on the library YouTube channel. So that'll be helpful. You can help spread the word or if you'd like to watch it again. Um, so artist senior living, how can we support you? Uh, we are happy to have a phone conversation if you're caring for a loved one or have a friend with dementia. We wanna be a resource for you. Of course, we'd be happy uh, to schedule an in-person or virtual tour and share information on our philosophy, our partnership with Johns Hopkins University in terms of our um, artist safety council. 
uh, you can reach out to Joyce White, who is our Director of Community Relations. Myself, I'm Patty Pelican, I'm the Director of Marketing, or Rebecca LaPelle, who is our Executive Director. We have some upcoming programs in September that you might be interested in. Um, so save the dates. Uh, September 15th, we're gonna be doing a wonderful program for caregivers. Take a break before you break. It'll be this same format where we'll do a Zoom program. And then also on Wednesday, September 16th, we're really excited to be opening our doors for an open house. And you can come between 10 a.m. and noon. Um, we're gonna have some brunch bites to go. And also um, uh, 5 to 7 p.m., if either of those times work better for you or friends, um, from 5 to 7, we're going to do a dine and dash. So you could come by for a tour, meet our amazing staff, and um, take a little tasty goodness to go with you. So once again, Artist Senior Living, uh, thank you for joining us here today. Thank you to the New City Library for this uh, wonderful partnership on this program. And of course, to Amy Matthews for just being such a wonderful educator and facilitator uh, for today's program. Thank you so much, and we wish you a, a wonderful and healthy day. Well, I just wanna say thank you very much to Amy. She did an excellent presentation. Oh, one, of the, one of the best ones I've seen. Thanks, Joanne. Thank you very much. Thank you for having this uh, informative uh, different uh, Zoom meetings. It's, it's very interesting and helpful. And if we have anyone here who's not um, familiar with our new city library programming, I do encourage you to go to our website and check out our events. We have, um, I've booked a solid for September. I think I have 17 individual Zoom events on a number of topics. So I hope you'll consider coming to some of our other programs as well. Well, everyone enjoy the beautiful day and weather, be safe. And from artists, family to yours, we thank you for participating. Have a great day. Bye.